Today, there are many markers that mock God, the idea that there is a God, the idea that there will be a judgment, the idea that there will be a penalty for sin. There are those that say, well, he hasn't come back. People for ages have been saying that the Lord is going to return. The Lord is going to exercise judgment. Yet I see the wicked living fine. I see no judgment upon them. But understand this, that the Word of God says the judgment may tarry, but it shall surely come. Oh yes, it shall surely come. And though they mock, and wrath may seem far off, it shall be executed swiftly, and at the appointed time. So we have all been given life. And it is appointed for us to die once and then face the judgment seat of God. Every person will stand before the judgment. And people know. There's many atheists today that claim that they don't believe in God, but they lie. Now, they may have deceived themselves into believing that lie. But inside they know, because the Bible says every man knows that God exists. And it's the truth. I want to read a few last words by atheists. I read some before. I'm going to read some again. Sir Thomas Scott, he's a he was a chancellor of England and a foremost outspoken critic of the idea of God. On his deathbed, and I'm just going to read part of it. Until this moment, I thought there was neither a God nor a hell. Now I know there are both. For I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty God. And can you imagine what all those people that followed him, that lauded him as a hero for reason and for intellectual thought, how that impacted them when they heard those last words. He said, until this moment, I thought there was neither a God nor a hell. And now I know there is both. God let him know, and God was speaking through him to others that were there. Amen? I said, God was speaking through him to others who were there, and others who would read this, and those who hear it this day. That one day you'll know don't let it be too late. You can rejoice that day. Or you can gnash your teeth at the dread of being cast into the fire. Now I know there is both. And I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. You see, when he came in contact with God, and we understand that when people die, they go to the grave and they await the resurrection. But there is no time in the realm of eternity. It doesn't exist as we think of it today. Even at the transfiguration, Jesus, Elijah, and Moses were translated forward into glory in the time of the kingdom when they would become, be in glory. So this can happen. God can do this to a person, even as he dies, to allow him to see something that ultimately he may not see until he's resurrected and after, at the judgment. But our next waking moment from the time we die is a judgment of God. It's to see the Lord return in all of his glory. Will you be ready? Will you be ready? Sir, Francis Newport, he was the head of the English Atheist Club. He, on his deathbed, he said, You need not tell me there is no God, for I know there is one, and I am in his presence. You need not tell me there is no hell. I feel myself already slipping. I know I am lost forever. Oh, that fire! Now, why do you think God allowed him to see as he was dying, 
allow him to come into his presence and see the difference, to see the, the separation of him cast into the outer darkness, into that fire. Except for God was giving word to others who were alive. Those, I mean, it would, the word would go out. Did you hear? Did you hear the last words of Sir Francis Newport? who was a champion for our atheist cause. Did you hear his last words? He said that he found himself in the presence of God and he found himself doomed because he had rejected God in this life. And he mentioned the fire. Oh, that fire. How many of you know who Anton LaVey is? Oh, I became introduced to him a long time ago. I know you would know him if you... He's dead now, but if you saw him, <clears throat> he is the author of the Satanic Bible. He's the one that wrote the Satanic Bible. And he often says there's a beast, he would say, there's a beast in us that needs to be exercised. Not exercised as cast out, but exercised means in working out, in to allow it to operate. There's a beast in us that must be exercised. In other words, exercise it so it can be stronger. He said exercise, not exorcised. Doesn't need to be cast out. But he found out something a little different on his deathbed. He said, oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. There is something very wrong. Every eye will see, every knee will bow, and there will be a righteous judgment. I have some points here that I'm going to read uh, before we get into any of the scriptures. That is, God's anger and his wrath is righteous. Amen. It is not a knee-jerk temper tantrum. God takes no pleasure. He's not striking out in anger as a man would. It is a righteous, just anger because it violates everything that is holy and good. Sin is satanic by its very nature. Sin is the nature of the devil, a liar, a murderer from the very beginning beginning, the pride of life, exalting self above God, coveting what does not belong to him, not appreciating what he has been given, the office that he has been given. There are people that live their life, that experience pleasure, that look at the beautiful sunset, that breathe the fresh air in the fall, that feel the warm sun, after a cold winter in the early spring, who smell the aroma, the sweet aroma of some, some food, delicious food that is baking, that laugh and enjoy life. God has given us the ability to experience so much beauty and so much pleasure And yet, how many people even stop to thank God for those things? To give God the glory for that. Thank you, Lord, that you have given me the ability. You've created me in your image, in your likeness, that I may experience what you experience. How many people stop and thank him for that? <clears throat> they take and they take and they take and they take from God, but they don't give anything back. And they deny him. He gave his son in order to bring them near, to save them. And yet they push him away. For what? From some fleeting pleasure of this world that's here today and gone tomorrow? It's like, your breath in the winter. 
you see your breath momentarily and then it disappears. That's what this life is like. That's what this world is. <clears throat> it's a foolish person to trade glory and pleasures forevermore and the fullness of joy for eternity and to be in perfect harmony with their purpose for which they were made and to behold their creator and to have him welcome them into his arms. It's a sad thing when people reject that. <clears throat> you might have noticed that O.J. Simpson <clears throat> was granted parole for his role in that armed robbery and kidnapping. I mean, all they did to kidnap someone nine years ago was say, stay here. <laughs> so that's not exactly what we would call kidnapping. But... <clears throat> A lot of the verdict for that, you know, that strong verdict that the, the lady judge had nine years ago, <clears throat> most people think it was because uh, everyone felt that he, not everyone, but a, a large percentage of the public believed that he had escaped justice in the deaths of his wife, Nicole, and of uh, Ron Goldman. Isn't that right his name? Because those who watched that trial on television, <clears throat> most of us believed that the, that the evidence was overwhelmingly against O.J. Simpson. Yet he was acquitted by a jury as not guilty. And some of the jurors, there was a couple of them, that said that part of that was payback for what the police had done, why police officers had done to Rodney King when they stopped him and that famous video of him being beaten by those police officers. And so people, a lot of people, especially the black community, and probably rightfully so, could not trust the Los Angeles Police Department. And they felt like it was corrupt. And a lot of them didn't necessarily believe that O.J. was innocent, but they felt like somewhere along the line, somebody's got to even these, even up the odds. And then some people just didn't believe it. But how did you feel? See, you wanted justice served. If O.J. was guilty, you wanted him found guilty, and you wanted him sentenced to either death or life imprisonment. That's what you wanted, because in you, the nature of God is crying out, for justice, you know, but the thing about it is we often want justice when it's somebody else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but see, when it comes to us, we tend to kind of justify our own sins. Well, it's a little bit different. And it, we may say, well, okay, I, yeah, I did that, but so-and-so did this. That's justification. Or maybe we may minimize, well, yeah, but I didn't mean it the same way as that person. That's wrong. We should acknowledge that we've come short of the glory of God, that we are sinners, that our motives are often corrupt, and that we need the Spirit of God to correct us and not to kick against that. Amen? Now, when you ask people, how do you think of God? What do you think most people will say? Well, I think of God as a loving God. I think of God as a loving father or a loving grandfather. That's how I think of God. I think of, of a God, a God of love and forgiveness and tolerance and mercy and kindness. That's how I think of God, as a beautiful white light that just is warm, makes me feel all fuzzy. That's how I think of God. How many people do you know, though, and that's not untrue. That's true. I think of God that way too. But that's not the only way I think of God. Amen? Now, if you were to ask my, parents, uh, my children, how do you think of your dad? Well, they'd say some of those same things, but they wouldn't stop there. <laughs> they'd say, yeah, yeah. He'd be 
quick to hug you and take you in his arms and play with you and kiss you and tell you he loves you. And then he'll whoop your butt. Oh, yeah. You get that bell down, he'll whoop your butt, you know. You get out of line, he'll, and there's what's worse than that, he's going to set you down and talk about it for about 30 minutes first, and then he's going to whoop your butt, you know. And that Jasmine saying, yeah, I know what that's like from my mom. <laughs> but see, that's love. God disciplines every child he loves, amen. And so that's, that's the nature of God. But most people think of God as only on the love, a God of love, mercy, a love, God of kindness and forgiveness. They, if they, when is the last time you ever heard anyone say, you know what, I think of God as a just God whose wrath is righteous. I think of God as a God of judgment. I think of God as a God that exercises fierce wrath. Most people don't think like that, do they? Yet, that is God. And that's the title of this sermon, by the way, is The Fierce Wrath of God. Because God's wrath is not only righteous, not only is it just, but it is fierce. Because He is a zealous God for His way. He is a zealous God for righteousness. Now, God usually delays his wrath. And because of that, a lot of people think that, well, he's not going, I guess what I'm doing is not that bad. I mean, obviously, the sky hadn't fallen on me yet. Understand this, though, and those of you who are watching and those of you who see this uh, video later, remember what I'm saying right here. That God does nothing without first warning through his prophets, those who prophesy, those who preach, he warns. He warned Nineveh. Nineveh did not repent. He warned Tyre and Sidon, Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't repent. Nineveh did repent, I should say. But the others didn't. And when Nineveh repented, how did they repent? They humbled themselves. They acknowledged that they were sinners. They didn't even know if God, they said perhaps, but perhaps God will change his mind. They didn't even know this God. Some guy was puked out of a big fish on the beach and he walked up there all smelly and wet in the streets. And he said, I should have been here earlier, uh, but I was at sea until I could see what I should be doing. And I'm here to tell you that God is going to destroy you. Now, Jonah didn't even give him, I mean, he didn't say repent. Maybe God will, will change his mind. No, he's ticked off. I mean, he, I, yeah, I've been swallowed by a big fish. I've been cast in the sea, swallowed by a big fish. I'm in there for a few days, finally I decide God is just. This is a righteous judgment against me. And I'm going to trust in God no matter what. So God sends him out. Okay, now you can do it. Now it looks like you're ready to preach the message. But he doesn't like those people, the Syrians. He don't like this warlike tribe, the Klingons <laughs> of the ancient world. He doesn't like them. So he says... You're going to get it. God is going to destroy you because you are wicked. You know what? They believed him. Even the king believed him. They said, yeah, maybe we are wicked. You know what? I think I see in my heart that I am wicked. So the king said, look, everybody, we're not going to eat, not even our cattle. We're not going to eat. We're not going to drink anything. We're going to take all of our nice clothes off. We're going to put on sackcloth. And we're going to not sit in our comfy pillows and our beds and our chairs. We're going to sit in ashes on the ground. Perhaps the God of Jonah, of, yeah, of Jonah will have mercy. And God did. Jonah didn't like it. Jonah sat up on the hill just waiting. What is going on? I mean, look what all I went through, Lord. Swallowed by a big fish. Puked out on the shore. 
walking around here telling all these people what you're going to do. I look like a fool. You're not doing anything. I look like a false prophet. They might even come up here and kill me. Maybe they won't think that God has had mercy. Maybe they'll think I'm a liar. So he sits up there and he's really wanting God to do something. All for personal reasons. He doesn't want what's right. But he does want what's just. But he only wants what's just for somebody he doesn't like. Amen? He doesn't want what's just for him. When the sun was beating down on his head, it was really hot. He didn't like it. Amen. But they repented. How many times did God send a prophet to Israel? Israel would stone them. Oftentimes, most of the time, Israel did not receive the prophet in a favorable way. But God sent the prophets. Amen. Peter Kreef, I don't know if, if you know who he is. I know him because he was one of the... Uh, Christian apologist that Lee Strobel went and interviewed in his book, The Case for Faith. And he was asking uh, Dr. Kreef about God allowing suffering. It was really good. I, I love uh, his analogies and his explanations that he made. But he made a comment. He said, the national anthem of hell is I did it my way. You know, Frank, Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. His signature song, he did it my way. Well, he said, that's the national anthem of hell. Do it your own way. So I want to read a few notes here. It is in man's nature to oppose and suppress God's truth. Amen? That's just in our nature. The reason for this is in order that we hold on to sin. That's why. Because there's something that we want to hold on to. The sinner opposes the idea of a holy God because he innately knows that such a God would hold him accountable. Amen? A just God must execute righteous wrath He's going to exercise it on somebody. It's either going to be on Jesus Christ for you and me, or it's going to be on us. If you die without Christ, it's on you. If you've ever heard the gospel or been presented the gospel. Now listen to this. We can tru never truly appreciate the fullness of God's love for us until we understand the fierceness of his wrath against us. Hear that? I'll say it again. We can never truly appreciate the fullness of God's love for us until we understand the fierceness of his wrath against us. We understand the fierceness of his wrath against us, seeing that we were sinners, yet having mercy upon us while we were yet sinners. Think about it. God's mercy withholding the judgment of God, withholding a righteous judgment, withholding his wrath that we deserve. That's his mercy. And his grace is a gift that we didn't earn, that we don't deserve. So he withholds what we do deserve, what we have earned. And he gives us something which we could not ever earn on our own. That's why I hate the idea when people say that grace is not unmerited, or is, it, yeah, is not unmerited. It, grace is unmerited. We did not do anything to receive that grace, to, to receive that gift. It is a free gift. When you say free gift, it means you didn't do anything to get it. It's a free gift from God. A free gift from God. But it's not free to God, you see. And think about people rejecting God's mercy, which means you're rejecting him withholding his wrath. And rejecting the grace means that you're rejecting the gift that he has given that will give you eternal life in his presence. And 
give you the divine nature of God. You're rejecting being a temple of the living God. Can God live in your temple the way you live? You hear me? I said, can God live in your temple? If you're a temple, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, do you not know that you're a temple of the living God? And if you destroy that temple, God will destroy it. You're a temple. Are you a temple that God can live in? Because a temple can be defiled by sin. A temple can ha hold in it idols that causes an abomination of desolation, cause the temple to be desolate. Listen here. There's three points that should be made about God's wrath. God's wrath is revealed from heaven. We see that clearly in Romans chapter 1. God's wrath is reserved for the ungodly, for those who will not be godly. You hear me? You will not be godly. In other words, you will not seek to be like God. You will not seek to obey God's will. You will not seek and strive to fulfill the purpose for which God has made you. And God's wrath is re reserved for the ungodly, Romans chapter 1 says. It's reserved for the ungodly. And point number three, God's wrath is restrained from the godly. That's the mercy of God. And God doesn't stop. He doesn't just stop and say, okay, I'm going to withhold my judgment. God gives us grace. He gives us a gift, which we cannot earn which we do not deserve. In order to do that, he justifies us by the blood of his own son. Do you hear me? I said he justifies us by the blood of his own son. What did you do to receive that grace? You didn't do anything except cry out for mercy, to admit that you're a sinner, to admit that you don't even deserve God's mercy. You don't even deserve anything. You don't deserve his mercy, much less the gift of grace that was realized and made possible by the shedding of the blood of his own son. But not only does he have mercy, not only does he pardon us, he gives us a covenant, a certificate, a position by which we are justified. We have been given a new life, a life without any record of sin. The devil cannot accuse you because there is nothing unrighteous, ungodly in the book of your life when you're in Christ. What is that worth? Those of us who see ourselves for what we really are in the flesh who is not who we really are. That's only who we are identified with Adam. Who we really are is who we are in Christ Jesus, a new creation. But those of, of, those of us who recognize, like Paul did, oh, wretched man that I am, we value that mercy. We value that gift of grace. Amen? So God's grace is revealed, God's wrath is revealed from heaven, God's wrath is reserved for the ungodly, and God's wrath is restrained from the godly. Now turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. <clears throat> Perhaps the most famous scripture in Christianity is 316, which we will read through that as well. But we'll begin in John chapter 3, verse 14. As Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And this word belief in Greek is pastuio. Pistuio, it means to abide in, to adhere to, to hang on to, to 
uh, join with. That's what it means. It doesn't mean just to believe with a thought. I mean, remember what James said? The demons believe and they shudder. But they don't adhere. They don't, you know, abide in Christ. They left their proper abode. Amen? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes, that is, adheres to, abides in, him will have eternal life. We see that in the parable of the the vine and the vine dresser. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's put your faith in him. Connect to him. Abide in him, and he abide in you. Invite him in. Say, okay, I'm going to be a temple Lord. I'm going to do what I can to clean this up. You do the rest of it. And I'll not quench your Holy Spirit. And I'll try to walk worthy of my calling. And I'll try to keep myself unstained by the world so that you have a holy temple to dwell in. Listen to me. God's wrath is revealed against the ungodly. There's as many as ungodly people in in Christianity as there is in the world. You hear me? Ungodly is as ungodly does. When the God gave me that word, I mean, it struck me when he said, judgment is coming upon this nation. Last night when we were praying, he showed me a map of the United States. And it's foggy. But he said, my judgment will come. And I will not repent of it. That's what he said. And I saw something in the state of Missouri. It looked like an explosion. I don't know what that means. But you know, Last week, or week before last, is that right? On Wednesday, yeah. When I was praying and the Lord began to speak for the first time in a long time, prophetically, and I'm not, you know, I haven't read it to y'all, I will. But he was still giving me understanding of what the scriptures he quickened me. He gave me understanding through Stacia last Saturday night. She just said, well, that scripture reminds me of this scripture that I like. And she mentioned one part of that scripture, her scripture, which is a long scripture, the very one part of that that was identified in my scripture the Lord had given me, the only verse in my entire chapter that God told me to read, the whole chapter in a psalm, the one verse that I thought had nothing to do was the main point. It was funny because when I had her read that chapter, the only part that she really noticed or said anything about was that one scripture, the very last verse, the one that I thought, well, I'm not even going to read that part when I read it to the congregation. That was the main part. But that's how God works. But God told me he had left America. He is withdrawn. His glory has departed. And he said, why? Because he can't share his glory. He he can't share his glory. He can't, America can't be that great shining temple on the hill, the great city of God on the hill, you know, when there's other gods there. And he told me that the God of America is entertainment. The God of entertainment. The people here have to be entertained. That's what they want. They seek entertainment. Whether it's through television, whether it's through movies, whether it's through video games, whether it's through sporting events, whatever it happens to be. You know, it's the wrong use of a good thing. It's a misuse of a good thing. Like what John was saying in his sermonette. That's the most dangerous sin. Is it okay to have pride in some things? We can be proud of God. We can can be proud of an accomplishment and give God the glory for it. That can be good. But if we have pride of self, self self-pride, you see. It 
sin is often, the most grievous sins are often, is the sin of the misuse of a lawful thing. The twisting, the perversion, like what was happening in the, the church at Galatia, where it was a perversion of the gospel. It wasn't, he said, it's not, Paul said it's a different gospel, then later on he said, well, it's not really a different gospel, it's just a distortion of the true gospel. And that's even harder. That's more deceptive, amen? Because people can say, well, God wants me. God created this for me. God wants this. God, I mean, God, I ever, God's people can do this, God. And then, you know, you're, you're just justifying it. Amen? You're out of balance. You can be completely, completely out of balance. You know, I've had the Lord tell me before, that's not for you. And he was telling me, don't look at somebody else. If I let, no, hey, if that's okay for that, maybe it's, but I'm talking to you. Uh, yeah, he'll do that. Can't look around and say, well, why come I can't? I mean, but, 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 but me, okay, but we'll be upset. No. God deals with us all different. I mean, you know, when he told Peter, you know, they're going to bind you and take you where you don't want to go. And he said, well, what about John? <laughs> What about your favorite over there? What about him? And Jesus just said, it's none of your business. So what? What if I, I mean, if I let him live until the day I come back, what's that to you? None of your business. You can't go around looking at everybody else. For God so loved the world, verse 16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. You see, the world might be saved through him. You know, Donnie, you were talking about universalism in, in your uh, sermonette. My mentor before Henry Anderson was my uncle, Doyle Johnson, my, my mother's brother who came into the Sabbath faith, faith, the holy day keeping faith, was extremely strict and straight down the line. I mean, he kept, I had two hard people. I mean, that would just take your head right off and hand it for me. And, uh, but my Uncle Doyle, I mean, people would, were afraid of him because he was so outspoken and he would cut you to the quick. I mean, he would come out of nowhere, you know. He'd say, what time is it? And I'd say, well, it's uh, 11.45. And he'd say, how do you know? Well, I, I was just looking at my watch. How do you know your watch is right? I mean, he would just, you know, challenge you that way. You get to where you wouldn't say, what do you want me to say? <laughs> That's what you got to get to where, like, did you, how did you want me to answer that? <laughs> you know, and I went from him then to Henry Anderson, which was even stronger, I guess, in, in some ways. Everybody feared Henry. So I had two, my two mentors were people everybody was afraid of. Uh, but, you know, I loved them, and they would cut me to the quick, but you know what? Whether they did it right or wrong, they did it wrong sometimes, I guess. But they were right in what they said. Maybe not in the way they always said it, but they were right in what they said. So I was never offended. I was never offended ever by them because I respected them and I knew that was just the way they are and maybe I needed that hardness. Maybe I needed, you know, a very plain and hard and, uh, you know, strictness from my mentors. But interesting, what I was getting at is that I saw my Uncle Doyle just kind of began to get watered down. <clears throat> it started, simply he just started going out to the VFW club a little bit and playing pool. He started playing at a tournament or two and then he started drinking a little bit too much and he got to where he would get a little bit intoxicated. And You know, I talked to him. I tried to talk to him about it. But it just got to where not that much mattered anymore. And he was extremely knowledgeable in the Bible. I mean, especially prophecies and things. But <clears throat> it got to the point to where he actually came to believe that everyone would be saved. That 
God's word would not be fulfilled if one person perished. Now, it's not God's will that any should perish, but God's word says most will perish. You know, it's not God's will, but God's will is, is those who will receive him and will receive salvation through his son should be saved. There is salvation in no other name. Therefore, there's no salvation in Muhammad. There's no salvation in Buddha. There's no salvation in the Hindu religion if you believe the Bible, if you believe the Word of God. Amen? But he came to believe that universal uh, doctrine. And it was sad. And he was a member of the Worldwide Church of God for many years. <clears throat> Verse 17, for God did not send the Son <clears throat> into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Now, we bring the light all the time. Listen, you and I, we have to be, do more than preach the gospel. We have to be the gospel, amen? Is that right or wrong? We have to be the gospel. In other words, it's not just about what we say. It's about our life. Our life has to be a reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen? So we have to be the gospel. If we spend as much time focusing on being the gospel rather than what the gospel says to others, you see, because our actions sometimes can speak so loud that no one can hear what we're saying. Amen. So we, want, we have to do both. We are not silent, but we have to be the gospel. The gospel has to be made manifest in our life. Amen. So this is a judgment, verse 19, that light is coming to the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. That's why. That's what I just said earlier. They don't like the idea. They oppose the idea of a holy God. Why? Because there'd be accountability. They don't like the light. Why? Because it exposes the evil that's in the darkness. The evil can flourish in the darkness, in the land of shifting, shifting shadows where there's not really a clear right or wrong. See, that's where a lot of people, that's where a lot of Christians are living right now, is a land of shifting shadows where nothing is exactly right and nothing is exactly wrong. And, and look, there are doctrines, there are positions where it's hard. It's hard to take a, you know, a dogmatic stand there because the scriptures, you can take the scriptures, honestly, you can see where the scriptures can mean two different things. But by and large, when it comes to how we live our lives and our approach to God and our yieldness to God and sin, it's very plain. Immorality is sin. Homosexuality is sin. Transgenderism is sin. It is receiving, actively receiving deception. Homosexuality is actively allowing yourself to be deceived and to believing that you were born a certain way. That you, you know, I mean, everybody has propensities for certain things, certain sins. That doesn't mean that you, you're, you don't have any control over what you do. Amen. <clears throat> so judgment, this is a judgment. That light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. That's why they like the darkness. You see, they don't want to know what's wrong with them. They don't want to be corrected. They don't want to change. They don't want to repent. The sinner doesn't want to repent. A sinner only wants to repent when his heart is convicted, and he sees that he's a sinner, and he sees that there is a judgment, and there's a wrath, and that there's no hope for him if he does not repent. You know, people may be diagnosed with a fatal disease or one that could be fatal, like a cancer or a heart disease or something like that, liver disease or whatever it happens to be, something that is like that could be life-threatening. And that's when they seek help. 
they want help. That's when they seek help. That's when they'll go to a doctor, you see, or that's when they'll pray. That's when, you know, God gets their attention to where they realize that they, when they you know, if they're, term, if they're diagnosed as a terminal patient, where the only, you know, the only power that they can turn to is God, then they, oftentimes that's when they turn to God. And sometimes God answers. Well, God always answers. Amen. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. The sinner wants you to agree with him. The sinner wants you to say to him that, you know, you may think it's wrong, but my truth is different than yours. Or I think God is, you know, God, this is okay with God. It's all right with God. You see, uh, I, yeah, Susie and I are living with each other, but it's okay with God because, you see, God knows that we love each other. Well, you love each other. You know what God does when he loves us? He has a covenant with us. Yeah, he makes a covenant with us. An official covenant with us before the angels of heaven. And he marries us. He, you know, he patrols us. Well, what does the Bible say about those who don't? But yet that's prevalent in our society today. It's accepted. You know why it's accepted? Because people have accepted it. You know why it's readily accepted? Because Christianity has accepted it for the most part. And Christianity is accepting homosexuality more and more, too. You see, it's just a steady erosion, erosion of the true faith, of the foundations of the faith. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds may be exposed. Now, the true light is going to expose evil deeds. Now, you can be a little old bitty light, a little old dim light come over there just to say, well, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just creating a little land of shifting shadows and nothing is quite clear. And it's, well, you know, we don't really know. I'm not going to be judgmental. But he who practices the truth comes to the light. He wants to know. So that his deeds may be manifest as having been brought, wrought of God. Now, uh, in verse 23, Five, this is when uh, John the Baptist's disciples come up to Jesus. He had began to baptize. His disciples were baptizing in the Jordan. I'm talking about Jesus' disciples. So the disciples of John are wondering what's going on. Verse 25, therefore there arose a discussion on part of the John's disciples with, the, with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you, speaking of Jesus, Beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptized. Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So he's saying, Look, God gave him that. You yourselves are my witnesses, and I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase and I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony, notice, has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now what do we see here? Let's read it again. He who believes or abides in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God abides on him. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1. You know, and abiding in the teachings of Jesus also means, you know, the hard things. You know, a lot of times it's, it's easy to think, well, it's just me and you, God. Well, that's easy. You know, it's hard to find fault with God, especially if you make up a God in the, with the imagination of your own mind. I want to create a God of my own liking, and I can love and cherish him. I'll just hug him. I'll just, just hug him. He's like he's not there, but I'll just pretend like he's there. But you know, it's not that simple. Jesus said all of the commandments of God can hinge on two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that one's a hard one. Whoa, wait just a minute. My neighbor is not so lovable as you, Lord. Uh, my neighbor gets on my nerves a lot more than you do. You see, I, you are God. You're my creator. Ooh, my neighbor is just, he's like me, except worse than me, of course. <laughs> he's much worse than me. I see all kinds of fault in him. But, uh, you know, surely there's another way around this. You know, our enmity, listen to me, our enmity with our fellow man, you know where it comes from? It comes from our enmity against God. If you don't have enmity against God, you won't have enmity against your fellow man. How do we know that we're the children of God? Tell me, what does the scripture say? That we love God and keep his commandments. How do we know that we love the children of God? That we love God and keep his commandments. How do we know that we love each other, our brethren? Well, because we love God. He tells us to. Well, first, we keep the first commandment that says, do ever, whatever I tell you to do. Then after that, he says, do this. Love your neighbor. Yep, the yucky ones too. <laughs> the obnoxious ones. The ones that get on your nerves. Love them too. When it's hard. When it's difficult. When you know they don't deserve it. Because you know what you're practicing? You're practicing being God. You're practicing being God. Being just like God. And he's created you to be God. The son of God. In his family. So our enmity with our fellow man comes from our enmity with God. If we're right with God, we will be right with our fellow man. Do you think Paul was right with his fellow man? Do you think Paul was betrayed? Yeah, lots of times. Lots of times. But how is it that he could live without enmity toward his fellow men when all of his kinsmen are trying to kill him, when he has been beaten up and suffered so horribly since he came to Christ at the hands of men, coming in the name of God, doing it in the name of God. How is it that he could go to his death, go to the end of his life and say, I've finished the race. I've taken hold of my body. I've buffeted. I've made myself bow to the will of God. And as far as I know, I hold nothing against anyone. I've harmed no one. That's what he said. As far as I know, And he'll say, may God forgive those. That was his attitude. You know why he had no enmity toward his fellow man, even though he'd been 
severely mistreated, perhaps like no man has ever been. It's because there was no enmity between him and God. That's why. Because there was perfect fellowship with him and God meant that he could do all things through that God who strengthened him. Even to the point of putting up with what seemed to be impossible circumstance, impossible people. But he he did. Amen. So remember that. If we ever have enmity toward a brother or sister, there's enmity to toward God. It's there. You're not going to go to God and say, it's me and you, God. And everybody else except them. That's not happening. That will never happen. First, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, notice verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. Now, you hear that? Maybe you suffer. Maybe you're suffering because God is making you worthy of the kingdom of God. Maybe God is making you worthy of being a king and priest for all eternity. Maybe God is making you worthy to judge the nations with a rod of iron and sit on thrones to be crowned with glory. Maybe. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, for our testimony for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus. Now, let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 18. Well, familiar passage here that we used in our explanation against generational curses. We'll just read a few verses here. And Ezekiel 18 verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Saying, The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are are set on edge. In other words, he's saying that the children are paying for what the fathers did. That God is doing it. Now, the children suffer for whatever people do. When you teach your children bad habits, of course, they're going to suffer for it. But then to say that God himself did it as a judgment is wrong. As I live, declares the Lord God, you're surely not going to use that proverb in Israel anymore. And here's the reason why. For behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul who sins will die. And then he goes on to say, but if he walks in my statutes and my ordinance so as to deal faithfully, he is righteous and will surely live, declares the Lord. It's up to you. Verse 20, the person who sins will die. 
The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. It's not going to be anybody's fault but their own when it comes down to it. There are no coattails. You hear me? No one is going to ride any coattails into the kingdom of heaven. You can't look and say, well, my grandpa, my grandma, my, you know, she prays for me. My, you know, and my mother, she was right. My dad is like a saint and there's no coattails. You're going to be judged and he's going to be judged. That's the way to be. And there's not a thing you can do except pray for God to bring someone who is outside the will of God to repentance. That's all we can do. We all know people. We are all close to people that are outside of the will of God. We know it. Sometimes they know it. Sometimes they don't know it. And all we can do is be an example. We have an opportunity to say something. That's fine. But the reality of it is you're going to have to stand yourself before the judgment and they are going to have stand before the judgment themselves. And you're not going to, I mean, I, I remember one time well, Michael received a, a citation uh, when he wasn't guilty. I knew the judge. And so Tran and I went to court and when Michael walked up there, he had his suit on and to be respectful to the judge, he walked up there and I walked up there and Treon walked up there and there we are. And Michael's grown. There's his mom and daddy. That bothered the judge. I should have known. And so the judge was talking to Michael and I said, Judge, I know the judge. We've talked lots of times. He's given me free advice. And I said, Judge, and he said, Mr. Lasseter, your son's a grown man. And he didn't like the idea of me butting in. I was just going to, I mean, I had, some, I had some information that I thought he should know. But he didn't want to hear it, you see. And Michael had to stand before that judge. I may have been there, but it was like I wasn't there. Trion may have been there, but it was like she wasn't there. The judge didn't care if we were there or not. To him, we weren't there. Made no difference. He is there to judge my son. And that's the way it will be, a judgment. Verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. Nor will the father bear the punishment of the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. You know when a person gets grown, when they get of age, they're accountable. There's nobody that doesn't make mistakes. We've all made mistakes with people who we love, who we've tried to help. We all have. But ultimately, God does nothing without first making known to whom he's going to do something with. If he's going to hold someone accountable, they're going to know. And they're going to be given an opportunity to repent. Their heart is going to, God does not have to have us to convict a heart. He may use you to convict a heart, but he don't need you. If somebody don't listen to you, if somebody won't receive you, if you can't talk to somebody that you care about and you really want to just help them to see, to come to Christ, to repent, if they don't listen to you, won't, I mean, that happens. But you know what? They can't stop God and the Holy sin and the Holy Spirit to convict their heart. Amen? The person who sins will die. The, the son will not bear the punishment of the father's iniquity. Verse 20. Nor will the father bear the punishment of the son's iniquity. The righteous of the right, righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself.
But if the wicked man turns from all of his sins, which he has committed, and observes all the statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him. Hallelujah. Because of his righteousness which he has practiced, he will live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord? Rather that they would turn from his ways and live. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered. For his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed, for them he will die. Notice that God calls turning away from him treachery. That's a, treach that's a treacherous act. That's treason. That is a, an act against the king, against the government of God. You know, if someone, you know, is a spy and they're, they get caught, then they're, they're tried for treason. They may be executed for a treasonous act. And in this God says, when a righteous person, when a person that has been cleansed by me has come to me, I have accepted them. I have sent my son and I myself dwell on them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they turn and commit iniquity and abominations that the wicked do. All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered for his treachery because it's a treasonous act which he has committed and his sin which he has committed. For them he will die. In other words, it won't be remembered all that he did well. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not right. Hear now, house of Israel, my way, is my way not right? Is it not your ways that are not right? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies because of it, for his iniquity which he has committed, he will die. Again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness which he has committed and practices judgment and righteousness, he will save his life. There's only one way, and that is yield to Jesus. But the house of Israel says, well, the way of the Lord is not right, and my, are my ways not right, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not right? Do we hear this all the time? Oh, well, you're just too strict. You're judgmental. You're not tolerant. Who are you to judge? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not come, become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions, which you have committed, make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Why will you die? <clears throat> For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. That's what he wants. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it, in it is the righteousness of God. It is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. <clears throat> for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness. Revealed from heaven against the ungodly. In other words, their life is devoid of God's will. God, they're not godly. In other words, they're not seeking God's will. They're ungodly. <clears throat> For the wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that's why they do it. Because that which is known about God is evident among them, for God made it evident. 
For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They didn't thank him. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. In other words, they wanted to believe something different, so they just started believing something different. They professed to be wise and they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image and form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Why? For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And when we serve ourselves, we're worshiping the creature because that's the same thing. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons a due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper. They think it's okay. They're fine. They can't see in the land of shifting shadows or in the land of darkness until you come along and you shine a light. They're being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding. They're untrustworthy. They're unloving. They're unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, They not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. They take comfort in numbers. There you have no excuse. People take comfort in numbers. If you point out the sins of people, they look around and say, well, everybody does that. Who doesn't do that? Well, everybody's lost without Christ. Everybody needs repentance. Yeah, everybody. (laughs) All have come short of the glory of God. That's why we need the Lord. I'm not saying anyone is better than you. I'm not saying I'm better than you. Because I had to receive redemption myself. That's what we say. We're not being self-righteous. We're saying that you need Christ just like I need Christ. That's what we're saying. We're saying without Christ we both perish. If I, if I turn away from Christ, then I've committed treason and I'm worthy of death. If you don't turn to Christ, maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't betrayed the Lord, but if you've denied the Lord, and we both perish. So for you and me, it's simple. Turn to Christ. Therefore, you have no excuse, verse 1. Every one of you who passes judgment for that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you, for you who judge practice the same things. And Paul's talking to the church. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you will escape judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God is to lead you to repentance? It's not to pat you on the head and say, well, it's all right, son. I'll take you like you are. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you were storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. 
to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, <clears throat> immortality, and eternal life. Listen to me. Is that what you're seeking? You better set that as your goal right now. If it's not, if you've lost that, put it back. By perseverance, do good. Obey God. You will seek glory and honor, immortality and eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what remains is wrath and indignation. And we'll conclude with Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I have in my notes Matthew chapter 25, chapter, uh, verses 30 through 46. Donnie read part of that. Actually, the part that, uh, that uh, was relevant to this message was also relevant to his. And that is that Jesus, when he returns, is going to separate the goats from the sheep. And that those who are outside of Christ are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. They're going to be cast into the outer darkness. That is the wrath of God that comes upon this world. So we'll finish here in Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 1 and 2 first. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. It's giving down to verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, God will always put people in a sinner's life or in someone who is weak, and to entice them to sin, or entice them to comfort them in sin. So let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. I mean, they'll say things like, well, yeah, but your dad is not perfect. Your dad is not perfect either. And they say this, or so-and-so isn't perfect. Your friend that's trying to talk some sense into you or trying to get you to repent. You know, he's not perfect either. He thinks he's so righteous. He's not perfect either. Nobody is saying that. Amen? No one is saying that at all. And when people are saying that, they're kind of saying that, well, you know, why would God then judge you and sentence you to the lake of fire, hold you accountable. I mean, if he's going to hold them, look, he can hold us both accountable. If I'm a hip, hypocrite, well, I'm going to the same place you are, sinner. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's not going to help you if I'm a hypocrite. Amen? It just means we're both going to find ourselves where we don't want to be. But somehow the sinner will take comfort. They'll look around and say, well, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church, so I guess I'm not going to be thrown in the lake of fire. Oh, no. It just means you're going to have more company there. That's all. That's all that means. It only means what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, that there's going to be there people there that also say, well, look what all we did in your name, Lord. We cast out demons. We healed the sick. We did all these things. In the name of the Lord, we had ministries in your name. But they didn't obey him. And he said, I never knew you. Depart from me. So let no one deceive you, verse 6, with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness but instead even expose them for disgra disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible 
when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Michael. Michael. 